Time magazine's recent cover exhorting people to eat butter could be viewed as a desperate attempt to revive dwindling print sales, but they claim to be reporting on real science. This systematic review and meta-analysis published in a prestigious journal that concluded that current evidence does not clearly support cardiovascular guidelines that encourage cutting down on saturated fat, like the kind found in meat and dairy products like butter. No wonder it got so much press, since you know, reducing saturated fat intake is a major focus of most dietary recommendations worldwide, aiming to prevent chronic diseases, including coronary heart disease. So, to quote the Center for Science in the Public Interest, what gives? Evidently, shaky science and a mission by the global dairy industry to boost sales. They interviewed an academic insider, who noted that some researchers are intent on showing saturated fat does not cause heart disease. In 2008, the global dairy industry held a meeting where they decided that one of their main priorities was to neutralize the negative impact of milk fat by regulators and medical professionals. And when they want to get something done, they get it done. So they set up a major well-funded campaign to come up with proof that saturated fat does not cause heart disease. They assembled scientists who were sympathetic to the dairy industry, provided them funding, encouraged them to put out statements on milk fat and heart disease, and arranged to have them speak at scientific meetings. And the scientific publications we've seen emerging since the Mexico meeting have done just what they set out to do. Here's some of the materials from that meeting. What does the industry think is the key barrier to increase worldwide demand for dairy? Yes, there's a global warming issues, other milks competing out there, but number one on the industry's list is the negative messages and intense pressure to reduce saturated fats by governments and non-governmental organizations. In short, the you know, negative messages are outweighing the positive. So, indeed, their number one priority is to neutralize the negative impact of milk fat among regulators and health professionals as related to heart disease. OK, so if you're the dairy industry, how are you going to do it? Uh, imagine you work for Big Butter, right? You've got quite the challenge ahead of you. I mean, if you look at the recommendations from around the globe, uh, there's a global scientific consensus to limit saturated fat intake, with most authoritative bodies recommending getting saturated fat at least under 10% of calories, with the prestigious U.S. Institute of Medicine and the European Food Safety Authority recommending to push saturated fat consumption down as low as possible. The latest guidelines from the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology recommend reducing trans fat intake, giving it their strongest A-grade level of evidence, and the same with reducing saturated fat intake. And since saturated and trans fats are found in the same place, meat and dairy, cutting down on foods with saturated fat will have the additional benefit of lowering trans fat intake. They recommend pushing saturated fat intake down to like 5 or 6 percent of calories. So you know, that's what you see when you go to the American Heart Association website, no more than 5 or 6 percent of calories. People don't realize how small that is. One KFC chicken breast could take you over the top, or you know, two pats of butter and two cubes of cheese, and you're done for the day. Uh, no more dairy, no meat, no eggs. Uh, that'd be about 200 calories. So they are in effect saying 90 percent of our diet should be free of saturated fat-containing foods. Uh, so that's like the American Heart Association saying, OK, two meals a week can be packed with meat, dairy, and junk, but the entire rest of the week should be you know, unprocessed plant foods. That's how stringent the new recommendations are. So this poses a big problem for big cheese and chicken. The top contributors of cholesterol-raising saturated fat, cheese, ice cream, more cheese, chicken, then non-ice cream desserts like cake and pie, and then pork. So what are these industries to do? Where did these consensus guidelines to dramatically lower saturated fat consumption come from? from literally hundreds of metabolic ward experiments, which means you don't just ask people to change their diets, you essentially lock them in a room for weeks if necessary and have total control over their diet. You can then experimentally change their level of saturated fat intake however you want, and see the corresponding change in their cholesterol levels. And the results are so consistent you can create an equation, the famous Hegstead equation, where you can predict how much their cholesterol will go up based on how much saturated fat you have them eat. So if you want your LDL cholesterol to go up 50 points, all you have to do is eat like 30% of your calories, saturated fat. When you plug in the numbers, the change in cholesterol shoots up 
right as predicted. The experiments match the predictions. In fact, you can do it at home with one of those home cholesterol testing kits. You know, eat a stick of butter every day, watch your cholesterol climb. Not rocket science. And look at this. This was 1965. We've known about this for 50 years. They even keep calorie intake the same. Increases in saturated fat intake are associated with highly significant increases in LDL bad cholesterol. Now your good cholesterol goes up a bit too, but that increase is smaller than the increase in bad, which would then translate into increased heart disease risk overall. So if you, you know, feed vegetarians meat even just once a day, their cholesterol jumps nearly 20% within a month. Uh, you know, to prevent heart disease, we ideally we need to get a total cholesterol under 150, which you can see these vegetarians were, but then even just once a day with the meat, and their cholesterol shot up 19%. But the good news is that within just two weeks of returning to their meat-free diet, their cholesterol dropped back down into the safe range. Now note that their HDL good cholesterol hardly moved at all, so their ratio went from low risk of heart attack to high risk in a matter of weeks with just one meat-containing meal a day. And indeed, randomized clinical trials show that dietary saturated fat reduction doesn't just appear to uh, reduce cholesterol levels, but subsequent cardiovascular events like heart attacks as well. So we have randomized clinical trials, controlled interventional experiments. These are our most robust forms of evidence. Right? So no wonder there's a scientific consensus to decrease saturated fat intake. You'll note, though, that the y-axis here is not cholesterol, but change in cholesterol. That's because everyone's set point is different. You know, two people eating the same diet, the same amount of saturated fat, the same number of uh, chicken nuggets a day, can have very different cholesterol levels. One person can eat 10 chicken nuggets a day and have a LDL cholesterol of 90. Another person can eat you know, 10 a day, could start out with an LDL of 120. It depends on your genes. Uh, but while our genetics may be different, our biology is the same, meaning the rise and drop in cholesterol is the same for everyone. So if both folks cut out the nuggets, the 90 might drop to 85, whereas the 120 would be expected to drop to 115. Right? Uh, wherever you start, we can lower our cholesterol by eating less saturated fat, but if I just know what your saturated fat intake is, how many nuggets you eat, you know, I can't tell you what your starting cholesterol is. All I can say with certainty is that, look, you eat less, your cholesterol will likely improve. But because of this extreme inter-individual variation, this wide variability in baseline cholesterol levels for any given saturated fat intake, if you take a cross-section of the population, you can find no statistical correlation between saturated fat intake and cholesterol levels, because it's not like everyone who eats a certain set amount of saturated fat is going to have over a certain cholesterol. So there's like three ways you could study diet and cholesterol levels controlled feeding experiments, free-living dietary change experiments, or cross-sectional observational studies. Right? Well, as we saw, there's a clear and strong relationship between change in diet and change in serum cholesterol and the interventional designs. But because of that inter-individual variability, in cross-sectional designs you can get zero correlation. In fact, if you kind of do the math, that's what you'd expect you'd get. In statistical parlance, one would say a cross-sectional study doesn't have the power for detecting such a relationship. Uh, thus, because of that variability, these kinds of observational studies would seem an inappropriate method to study this particular relationship. So since diet and serum cholesterol have a zero correlation cross-sectionally, an observational study of the relationship between diet and coronary artery disease incidence will suffer from the same difficulties. So again, if you do the math, observational studies would unavoidably show nearly no correlation between saturated fat and heart disease. These Prospective studies can be valuable for other diseases, but the appropriate design demonstrating or refuting the role of diet and coronary heart disease is a dietary change experiment. And those dietary change experiments have been done. They implicate saturated fat, hence the lower saturated fat guidelines from basically every major medical authority. In fact, if we lower saturated fat enough, we may be able to even reverse heart disease, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery. But wait a second. Let's put our big cheese and chicken hat back on. Observational studies would show no correlation, mathematically could show no correlation. We've known since 1979 that observational studies simply don't have the power to show the relationship. Bingo! 
All we need now is a friendly researcher. How about Ronald M. Krauss, funded by the National Dairy Council since 1989, also the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, as well as the Atkins Foundation? Perfect. Then you just combine together all the observational studies that don't have the power to provide significant evidence, and what do you know? No significant evidence was found. This uh, 2010 meta-analysis was basically just repackaged for 2014 using the same and similar studies. As the chair of Harvard's nutrition department put it, their conclusions regarding the type of fat being unimportant or seriously misleading should be disregarded, going as far as suggesting the paper be retracted, even after the authors corrected a half dozen different errors. Uh, but it's not like they falsified or fabricated data. They didn't have to. They knew beforehand the limitations of observational studies. They knew they'd get the you know, right result, and so they published it, right? helping to neutralized the negative impact of milk and milk fat by regulators and medical professionals. And it's working, brags the dairy industry. Perceptions about saturated fat in the scientific community are changing. This is a welcome message to consumers who may be tired of hearing what they shouldn't eat. They don't have to convince consumers, just confuse them. Confusion may be easily misused by the food industry to promote their interests. It's like that infamous tobacco industry memo again. Right? Doubt is our product. Doubt is our product, since it's the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public. They don't have to convince the public that smoking is healthy to get people to keep consuming their products. They just need to establish a controversy. Some science say it's bad, some science say it's not bad. Conflicting messages in nutrition cause people to become so frustrated and confused they may just kind of throw up their hands in the air and eat whatever they want, which is exactly what saturated fat suppliers want, but at what cost to the public's health.